In my program, uh, I was sort of undecided, so there were five topics for four lectures, and this was obviously optimistic, but uh, I want now to um, describe something which have been, which is important, which is the Orbifold Fundamental Group, which you heard also in my lectures about Orbifolds, and uh, at least this is not so uh, difficult to define abstractly. Uh, so assume that Z is a good topological space. So good means that there exists universal covering. I denote by gamma the fundamental group of uh, Z, and I assume that a group, uh, let me say G, acts properly discontinuously on Z. And then you define the orbifold fundamental group of Z and the group action, this is just defined as, let me also call it gamma tilde, which is the set of lifts. Gamma tilde are lifts of uh, transformations in G to the universal covering. So by definition, uh, now since this is the universal covering, by the theory of coverings, every gamma has a lift. And so, uh, since C tilde is universal covering, this implies that we have an exact sequence gamma, gamma tilde, onto G. And, okay, which I want to denote by double star. Okay, good. And in particular, from the definition you see that, uh, so remarks, the first remark is that uh, Z being Z tilde over gamma, Z over G is just Z tilde over gamma tilde. And the difference is that, however, uh, gamma tilde doesn't act freely. This is the first remark, and assume, yes, if G acts freely, yeah, so is however not necessarily free. And the second remark is that if G acts freely, Then, in this case, gamma tilde is the fundamental group of Z mod G. And the third remark, which is quite important, is the following. Assume that Z is a classifying space for uh, gamma. So, if Z is a classifying space for gamma, so this means that C tilde is contractible, well, we know that homotopy uh, for a classifying space, uh, 
homomorphies of groups correspond to homotopy classes of continuous maps. And so, in this case, uh, uh, star star determines the topological type of the action. Because in this exact sequence, uh, G, H element here, gamma in G, I call it gamma because later G will be the genus. I take gamma, and this X by conjugation on the normal subgroup, and this is nothing else than the action on the fundamental group. And the action on the fundamental group is the term is the topological type. So conjugation by gamma is gamma star from the fundamental group of Z to the fundamental group of Z, and since this is a classifying space, this homomorphism determines the topological type. Mine is again how gamma star acts is. Excuse me? I mean, it, it moves the base point, so. Yes, but the topological type is up to, uh, everything is up to in inner conjugation of gamma. This is up to inner conjugation of gamma. Okay? So if his base point is this, and then you must always take the class in, in there. So anyhow, this I would have said also. Okay, so um, since time is limited, I will skip how you practically uh, calculate this fundamental group, but I want to give, uh, to see how this is relevant. So case one, assume that, uh, so uh, I want to have a classifying space, so I take A, an abelian variety, and G is a group of automorphism of A, okay? So two days ago I consider the case where G is acting freely. And now, this time, G doesn't need to act freely. Okay, so now, A is the quotient of a vector space, complex vector space V, divided by lambda. Lambda is the fundamental group of A and is Z to the 2N. Now, the, we have, therefore, we have 1 lambda, let me call it gamma tilde uh, G1. So we have this orbifold fundamental group. Now, we know that gamma tilde is a group of affine transformations. And these are fine transformations, and lambda tends for Q to itself, uh, and this is contained in the fine group of V. And, and there is an easy proposition, is that uh, gamma tilde, the abstract group uh, gamma tilde, determines the affine type. Uh, of this representation.
So essentially, G X by conjugation on lambda, and this is, is an, a, a fine group, so uh, G X on, and then you take the kernel of this will be a maximal lattice. And uh, yeah, so that's the idea. So in fact, uh, you have, um, so in fact, the idea is that there exists lambda prime uh, let contained in lambda tensor Q, lambda prime contained in gamma tilde, and then you have And then G prime is uh, is contained in the linear group. So the image uh, in the linear group, the linear part is determined by killing by lambda prime, which is just the centralizer of lambda. So anyhow take this proposition. I tried to sketch the proof, but maybe it's a little bit too quick. But this is somehow important. So for these quotients, uh, uh, even if it's not free, I know that this orbifold fundamental group determines the affine type. Now, uh, this has to do with moduli, because now uh, so in this case, the case of abelian variety is a uh, particular case, simple case for moduli, because uh, the fundamental group is lambda, so the moduli space for abelian varieties, well, for tori, and then abelian varieties is more complicated, so let me do for tori, I have this, I have lambda, and lambda tensor Q lambda tensor C is written as V plus V bar. So this is the Hodge decomposition. So lambda is a fixed lattice, then you consider lambda tensor C, and uh, to give a complex torus with this group is the same as giving a, a complex subspace with the property that V plus V bar give as direct sum the whole thing. And so this is parametrized by Grassmann manifold. Now, uh, this is for Tori and for abelian variety. Now, in our case, the moduli For pairs A and G, like this, now uh, it's rather clear that uh, G must act by transformation. So you want, uh, uh, we need that uh, this, the, the above decomposition is G invariant. But translations, they don't change, the, they have a trivial linear part, so this is the same as being G prime invariant. So, in order to understand the moduli spaces of pairs of uh, such a torus with a group of automorphies, we must give uh, a, such a decomposition which is invariant by G prime. Okay, so now uh, this is uh, how to say, yeah, I already defined G prime, so um, now I know that lambda tensor C is a G prime representation. And G prime is a finite group, so I can write that lambda tensor C is a direct sum over uh, rho 
an irreducible representation of G prime of a direct sum of an isotypical component. So let me write W rho uh, to the n rho. And since V must be J prime, so V must be a sub representation and so this is let me write it as dub, w rho is the irreducible representation and so if I write this w rho tensor uh, uh, let me tensor, what is my notation, M rho. So I can write this isotypical component as an irreducible representation times a trivial representation. Then uh, V must be a sum, a direct sum of V rho. And so, uh, and V rho must be equal to W rho tensor uh, a subspace U rho. U rho a subspace of M rho. And then there is some part which I had prepared in the notes but since the number of sheets is too much and then you have to satisfy this condition here. So I omit here and then have to satisfy sharp. Okay, so there is some condition which I say with words. If rho is a, uh, there are two types of reducible representations. The representations which are real, isomorphic to the conjugate, then you choose a subspace of middle dimension. Otherwise, you are rather free. And uh, the interesting remark the interesting remark which explains a lot of classical beautiful geometry is that uh, if n rho is 1 for each rho there is only a finite number of possible complex structures. Because well, I have here u rho is a subspace of m rho, m rho has dimension 1, and so it's either everything or nothing. And so you just, for each rho you decide, okay, for each rho you decide this summand either goes to v or it goes to v bar. Okay, so this is, uh, uh, I think that's enough for this case. Of course, you can have fun in working out, working out in more detail this modelized space, but this is rather important because uh, um, you can really describe the modelized space of such tori with certain actions. There is a little bit more to work, but it's fine. So, this is the first interesting case of projecting uh, class. Uh, K pi 1, abelian variety. The second case, which I want to describe, because even if I, uh, I will say a little bit too much for the final purpose, but I think curves are such an important object that I think we want, we, we heard so much with uh, Marianne uh, this morning about curves, and I want to say something else about curves, which is still uh, uh, more related to the point of view of Riemann. So case 2, is where G is at least 2 and C is a curve. So 
So G is a projective curve of genus G. So that I know by the uniformization theorem is that C is just the upper half plane divided by pi G. This is the fundamental group of any curve of genus G. So in this case, we have again the orbifold fundamental group. So assume now, uh, assume that G is contained in the group of automorphism. We get an exact sequence, the usual exact sequence, or before the exact sequence, pi G, and then how do I want to call, yeah, pi 1 or before, and then G. I get this exact sequence. And as I observed already, we have again a classifying space, so this exact sequence determines the topological action. Now, um, I know that if I define, so H, this is quite interesting, so it's a small digression, but uh, now H modulo pi 1 orbifold is equal to uh, C divided by G, and let me denote C prime the quotient. So, uh, the fact, the uniformization theorem is responsible of the fact that the orbifold fundamental group is a group of transformations of the upper half plane is a so-called Fuchsian group. And this is responsible of the fact that there are so many results which are proven either in algebra and geometry or using hyperbolic geometry. Some people want to talk about orbifold fundamental groups and the other talk about Fuchsian groups, but it's the same thing, okay? Now, uh, the invariant, so now I consider the mapping C goes to Z mod G equals C prime. This is a covering, uh, it's, a, it's a covering of degree, is a Galois covering. The degree is the order of the group, and there are Y1, Yd are the branch points, and M1, Mg are the ramification indices. So these are the points such that uh, the fiber uh, consists of order of G divided by MJ. So locally you get this. Okay, so now uh, in this case uh, we have com the orbifold fundamental group, so we define G prime to be the genus of the quotient curve C prime. And now, uh, by looking at the completion of the associated and ramified covering, one finds that the orbifold fundamental group is generated by generators alpha 1, beta 1, alpha g prime, beta g prime, gamma 1, gamma d, with the relations that gamma j to the mj equal 1, and gamma 1, gamma d, and times the product for i between i and uh, i and no, 1 and g prime of the commutators. is equal to 1. And so we simply say that this alpha I beta, yeah, thank you, sorry. <laughs> when I try to be, I, I should go slowly. If I try to be quick, then I, <laughs> okay, thank you. So this is, uh, this abstract group is the fundamental, is pi g d prime Pi G, pi G with uh, um, multiplicities M1, MD. So, for instance, when D is zero, this is just for D equals zero. 
you get the fundamental group of a curve of genus G prime. So this is a very concrete description and by the Riemann existence theorem uh, such an isomorphism with pi g d prime m j plus this exact sequence determines a covering of c prime a covering c of c prime branched on y1, yd. So varying the curve c prime and varying the points y1, yd, once I have these, so I get a family of dimension equal 3g prime minus 3 plus d. So now I want to explain uh, I'll do it here. Can I erase this or the lunch is just in the usual mensa. So now I want to explain the needs and realization. So, maybe, oh, no, let me continue here to say that uh, the topological type is determined, I have this exact sequence, by a homomorphism rho from G, so GX by conjugation on this group but as uh, Johnny remarked we have not fixed the base point so we must take divide by inner conjugation and so we go to, we get outer automorphism which is the quotient of automorphism divided by inner automorphism and indeed it's uh, G is holomorphic so is orientation pre preserving so it really lands in the orientation preserving subgroup now this group here is also called the mapping class group. So, the Nielsen realization says the following. Assume okay. So, uh, the first remark, if I assume that I have a, a mapping which, Okay, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> So, so if I get a mapping here to the, autom the group of outer automorphism, well, you know that the center PG is isomorphic to the group of inner automorphism. Because it has no center. There is no element which is in the center, so we have this exact sequence 1 uh, pi g, automorphism of pi g, 
outer automorphism of pi g. And so you see that from these, g is contained, uh, if g maps here, so if I take rho of g, then I get here some gamma tilde, and then I get pi g. So rho determines uh, an extension, and the what is important is the theorem of Lefschetz is that if G is a group of uh, biholomorphies, then rho is injective. Because Lefschetz says that uh, an automorphism of a complex curve of genus at least two cannot be homotopic to the identity. And the reason is very simple because the self-intersection of the diagonal, you see, if you have a, an automorphism which is not the identity, the intersection number with the diagonal uh, is positive. But the, if this is a diagonal contained in C times C, but the self-intersection of the diagonal is 2 minus 2g is negative. If a g is at least 2, this number is negative. So you see that this graph cannot be uh, homologous to the diagonal. Otherwise, the intersection number would be negative and not positive. This implies that uh, for each gamma in G minus the identity, gamma is not homotopic to identity. So the theorem of Lefschetz says that if you have a group, so this is the restriction on the topological type. The topological type of a group of biholomorphism yields here an Embedding. So in our case, we have rho of g is really isomorphic to g. I can here erase. So under these restrictions, and then you see that rho from rho I recover this extension. And the Nielsen realization is the theorem for each rho uh, as above, injective. And this is a very strange, this is a theorem of algebra. It says that such an extension, gamma tilde, is uh, isomorphic to some uh, group of the form this. Okay, so this is a realization which was proven quite late uh, by Kerkhoff in the 70s and then reproven by Trom, but just says that uh, um, once you give a topological action on the group with this property that uh, rho is injective, then you find some curve with this topological type of action. <laughs> God bless you. So now I want, even if not strictly needed, I want to say what is the relation of the moduli spaces of curves with symmetry. So I fix now, fix uh, the underlying differentiable manifold and G to C. Whatever is the curve, uh, the, all the curves are diffeomorphic. 
And now one defines Teichmüller space. So you um, you define Teichmüller space is the set of complex structures on N G modulo diffeomorphies of N G which are isotopic to the identity. And there is a theorem says that tau G is contractible of complex dimension is 3G prime minus 3 and the moduli space of curves is the quotient of this is a contractible manifold, complex manifold. Okay? Mg is Tg divided by the mapping class group and the mapping class group has two incarnations. Map G is on the one side the group of outer automorphism of the fundamental group which are orientation preserving. On the other hand is just the quotient of all group of orientation preserving diffeomorphism modulo those in the connected component of the identity. So this is the complex analytic representation of the moduli space of curves. There are so many names, alphas and bears and others. And moreover, the the curves for which rho of G is contained in the automorphous group of G is exactly the fixed locus of rho of G which we denote by T G rho and T G rho is a complex is a complex manifold diffeomorphic to R and of dimension twice uh, three G prime minus three plus D. And moreover, the image MG rho of TG rho inside the moduli space is a closed algebraic set. So these are, so this is the locus of curves which has a symmetry group of G with this topological type. And since this is a connected, uh, I forgot, yeah, it's diffeomorphic to this, so it's connected, and so is an irreducible. closed algebraic set. And so now an interesting question which is not completely solved and is quite interesting is to understand this stratification in the moduli space of curves given by the curves with a certain type of automorphism. So um, first of all when you do modulites now, uh, I, now I, we define the moduli space of 
of G marked, of rho marked curves. Let me write of curves with rho marked symmetry is just M G bracket rho and you just take this thing here and you divide it by the centralizer of rho of G. So this means that you not don't only take the curve but you take the curve and the marking, the action of G. And you want isomorphies which preserve the action of G. If they preserve the action of G, they must centralize this. So this is a centralizer. So now the next question is to understand So let me erase the abelian varieties, which have already been treated. So the, the question is to understand the sub-varieties M, G, Rho, and their intersection behavior. So now there is an interesting question which was already, is not completely solved, and is the following. Uh, for each curve, in this set, it has G as a group of automorphies, at least, but it could have a larger group of automorphies. So one gives, and this happens, so one gives the following definition, H, this will be rho of G, a subgroup of the mapping class group is not full If there exists an H prime containing H and different from H such that the fixed locus of H is equal to the fixed locus of H prime. So this means that every curve with H symmetry has a larger symmetry. So it's rather clear that when we study this loci, uh, we can restrict to the full subgroups. Excuse me? So H prime also acts basically on the common. Yes. Oh, it's a subgroup, so it acts faithfully. H is contained this and this is in map G. Thank you. This okay, I had forgotten to say that there exists another sub bigger subgroup of the mapping class group containing it. Okay, which I said every curve with this group of symmetries has a larger group of symmetries. And now there is a proposition. So all these loci uh, when we, st 
and then by the definition suffices to consider the case where H is full to study this loci and the proposition is that um, if H is full then we have a factorization so the marked moduli space this is just Tg rho divided by the centralizer of rho of G this maps to the quotient by the normalizer of rho of G and this is called mg rho and this goes to this locus in the moduli space mg and this is the normalization map so these are you see here you are fixing the action of G but now here you permit to change this action up to automorphism of G and so this is just uh, the picture so in a sense when we this these loci are sub varieties which are not normal but their normalizations they correspond to these uh, moduli spaces but when the subgroup is full so what is known about the full subgroups? The full subgroups are not completely classified, but there is a partial classification. And this is a theorem so if fix of H is fix of H prime and H prime is full then so this theorem is, was proven by Singerman and a lot of people and other proved by Maggard and so uh, it's six names so let me skip giving the names, the credits I have no credit then this implies that delta, the dimension of Z is at most three and I say this is a partial classification and if delta equal 3 there is a description as follows then we have C goes to C modulo H this goes to C modulo H prime and uh, this is just uh, the composition here, let me call it F, then F is branched in three points, in six points and C modulo H is the uh, in, sorry, is branched in the six points C modulo H prime is isomorphic to P1 and C H has genus 2 and so this means that this is of degree 2 and so it's a double cover branched in six points
and delta equal to there is a certain description and so on. So the theorem is quite long and morally what is important is you see that uh, for each dimension you describe it follows that the index of H in the full subgroup is 2 or at most 4 and one has a precise description. But uh, though, so this is a complete classification uh, the classification is not possible. On the other hand, this theorem shows that uh, there is this problem that a subgroup cannot be full. But this only happens if this strata has small dimension. If the dimension is big, we don't need to worry. They are always full. And so, how to understand the next question understanding the topological type. Means row up to conjugation in the mapping class group. Well, this group is complicated. So, this is a very interesting question, at least for me, but also for the topologists should be, and for the algebraic geometers. So, how to describe the topological type? So, uh, what I want to do now is to describe the invariance of the topological type. So, some invariants are already written here. So, the basic invariants are G prime, the genus of the quotient, D is the number of the branch points and now you realize one thing that if I take here a curve of genus G prime and I go to a base point here here is Y1 and here is the base point Y0 I can go here, but I can also go to this path in this other way. So, uh, I define AI is the image of alpha I in G, BI the image of beta I, and CI is the image of gamma I. And what is important, I denote, so uh, the Nielsen function is a function from the set of conjugacy classes in the group G to N, and it just says, uh, nu of C is the number of local monodromies which are in the conjugacy class. This is an important invariant which was considered by Nielsen and is the only invariant for cyclic groups. Right, but you see, all these invariants, when uh, D is zero, there is nothing which remains. Because there, D. Yeah, but for D equals zero, here comes, again, to help us, 
the topology, the classifying space. For d equals 0, I had a, a subjection from pi g prime to the group g. Now, we know that the homomorphism of groups induces a continuous map of classifying spaces. Let me call it Psi, a continuous map of classifying spaces. So I get Psi. Now the classifying space for the fundamental group of C prime is obviously C prime. And this goes to the group BG. Now a continuous map which is given, this continuous map is given up to homotopy. But two homotopic maps have the same action on homology. And so H2 of Psi with coefficients in Z goes, sends uh, uh, the second homology of C prime to the second homology of the classifying space for G, and this by definition is the second homology of the group. Now, C prime is oriented, so this is a multiple of the fundamental class of C prime. So I get an invariant epsilon is the image of the fundamental class. Uh, so now, uh, well, that's nice. But how do we calculate this? So here again, algebraic topology comes to rescue through an important theorem of Hopf, which I probably explained in the beginning of the last lecture. But let me explain the theorem at least. The theorem of Hopf is the following. Assume that G is the quotient of a free group F by a group of relations. Then the second homology of G with integral coefficients, which by the way is the same group as the, gr the <laughs> second homology of G with coefficients in C star, is the same group which we saw in the first lecture using Pontryagin duality. This is just the following. You take the commutator subgroup of F intersected with R and divided by the commutators of elements of F with relations. Please, at the moment you must believe this, okay? I will try to give an idea because it's, it's quite nice how you use uh, uh, topology. And now, what is epsilon? Well, epsilon, so, and then corollary is that epsilon is just the product of AI hat commutator with BI hat, where AI hat, BI hat are lifts. of AI respectively BI in F. So see what is the upshot is that now we have D is zero, the product of these commutators in zero 
And the proof is very simple because the product of the commutators AI BI is 1. Because if something was 1 and you have a homomorphism, it goes to 1. So this implies that uh, this product of commutators maps to 1, so epsilon is in R. But you see, obviously, epsilon is a product of commutators. Well, that's not the proof, so I mean, uh, at least I'm saying that <laughs> this makes sense. <laughs> the proof is a little bit more complicated, but epsilon obviously is a product of commutators. So this is the way to describe the invariant. And now what do you do in the branch case? So in the in the ramified case epsilon if in the case d is positive so the idea is is the same um, i take epsilon is the product of this lifts of the CJs times the lifts of the commutators, the commutators of the lifts of this AI and BI. We define this as invariant. But it, but it must be well defined and then this is an invariant in the group G gamma which is F divided by R gamma and the, th the thing which changes is that instead of dividing only by F bracket R we also divide by relations A hat B hat uh, C hat minus inverse B hat inverse whenever uh, we have C is B inverse A B and C is in gamma and gamma is the union of the conjugacy classes of the elements Cj. So these are the conjugacy classes where the Nielsen function is at least one. And if it's not indelicate, you're five minutes out of time. Yeah. Should I stay should I go over time two minutes now and state the theorem? I think so. Maybe yes, otherwise the notation. So Thank you for Janet. So there is a remark is that epsilon determines Ni. And if Ni of epsilon is Ni of epsilon prime, then epsilon and epsilon Ni they differ by some subgroup, by an element in H. 2 gamma, which is a quotient of the homology group divided by this image of R gamma. So in a sense, uh, this 
this new invariant and this new invariant was given in a work with Lerner and Perroni. So I would like to finish just stating the, the theorem which is answers this question here. We want to understand the topological type. And so the main theorem, which is due to Dunfield and Thurston, for d equals zero, and myself with Lerner and Peroni for d positive, this says that if the genus G prime is large enough, then the topological type is determined by epsilon and is taken modulo oh, forget about it. the topological type is determined by epsilon and this is called genus stabilization okay <laughs>